you think I can't see you out there. I know. You're, with that little jingle, some of your heads are going like, I know it. That's how it works. You guys at home, same deal. So here's the thing. I, um, I caved. I completely caved. I gave up. I swore that I never would. In Christmas's past, I told Mandy and Joseph and Karsten and Hannah, like, no way, not going to happen, never. I may have even used the phrase, over my dead body. However, this year I have capitulated. I gave up. I surrender. I completely caved because the Marshall family has a fake Christmas tree. <laughs> and not even that, a pre-lit fake Christmas tree. No! Don't, okay, real quick, we've been doing this like a couple weeks in a row now. It's going to get old. But how many of you are fake Christmas tree people? Okay, how many of you are like real Christmas tree people? And you're dogging about it, aren't you? I know it. Because you're like, you other people, right? Isn't it like these holier-than-thou jabs that we throw out at Christmas time? It's great. I remember being a kid, you, you get these things, right? See if you can complete these little holier-than-thou passive-aggressive jabs. It's better to give than... Thank you. Christmas, it's not about getting, it's about the giving, right? Try telling that to your six-year-old self. You're like, nah, not happening. We know we're supposed to give at Christmas time, right? That's what this is about, but giving is so hard. This year, I think here's the question, and just to drive right to the point, how do you give when you feel like you have nothing left? Here's the tension that I feel, and maybe many of you in this room are feeling. I know a lot of us in our world are feeling. Give more. Really? Like, this is the third week of this Advent Conspiracy series, and we're talking about giving more. And you're like, give more. Really? What are you, serious? Like, most of us, if we're honest, are in a season where we have this deep and nameless loss. And I'm not talking about your bank account. I'm talking with somebody this last week. Um, we were talking about Christmas and this idea of giving and they said, like, I'm just so tired. I've given and I've given and I've given and I can't give anymore. I don't have any more emotional reserves. I'm just tired. And I think there's some truth to that. Some, some of us feel we have less margin, less motivation, less clarity, even to the point of what you might call spiritual poverty. It's been a long while. So you hear me lob those words out there, give more, and you're like, well, okay, sounds great, but I'm in this emotionally tough place. How do I give when I have nothing left? Sure, I'll give, but how? What? Maybe more importantly, why? <laughs> but as is so often the case in life, I think it's when we are faced with what we don't have that we can receive what God wants to give us. So this is the third week in um, this Advent Conspiracy series, and in case you missed it, or in case this is your first week joining us, Advent Conspiracy, this first word, Advent, it's this old English word, means coming, where we celebrate the coming of this long-expected king. Joy to the world, our Lord has come. Come thou long-expected Jesus, right? This, this idea that he's drawing near, and so we celebrate this, Advent. But then that wonderful word, conspiracy, and you're like, don't we have enough of that these days? <laughs> like, I don't need another one. Conspiracy is this idea that is kind of rooted in this subtle question, like, what, what if? What if? What if the way we thought about Advent and practiced Advent was consistent with what we believe about Advent? What if Jesus was just as prominent in our lives around Christmas as he is in the nativity scene on Christmas? What if? What if we really worshipped fully, spent less, gave more, and loved all, like these four weeks are training us to do? So that's where we're going today. I'm going to talk about giving more. What does this mean to give more? And I'll let you know, we're not just talking about your checking account. It's much, much more beautiful, and much more compelling than that, because I think our world needs more than that. So for you note-taking types, here's where we're going. Here's your little summary statement, if you want to hang on to this. If you want to give what's best, we need to give what's or what lasts. If we want to give what's best, we've got to give what lasts. And so for that, we're going to turn our attention to the book of Acts, chapter 3. You can thumb there, flip there, get there. It's going to show up on the screens in just a little bit. But before we get to Acts, chapter 3, a little bit of context before we uh, kind of dive in. So the book of Acts is not a Christmas book. 
And Acts 3 is not a Christmas time story, so leave the stockings on your mental mantle for a minute. Leave the wise men, the shepherds, the angels over here for a few minutes. Because as good as that is, there's something else that we need to see, especially when it comes to generosity. How do you give when you have nothing left? And Acts 3 finds us in the early days of the church. And if we could rewind the tape to see church back then, here's what we might find. I'm just going to read this to you. This is the tail end of Acts 2. Just listen to the description of the church that, that Luke gives us. He says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings, distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Like That's a description of a movement that is as remarkable as it is unstoppable. This little window, this beautiful screenshot into the spiritual life of our spiritual ancestors. This is the church at its birth. At the risk of massively oversimplifying, here's what we see in that text, just to sort of get our bearings, especially when it comes to thinking about church. Four practices in the early church. I'm going to hit them in 30 seconds here. They all start with the letter G for you note takers. First off, gathering. You see them gathering. They're reminding themselves of the things of Jesus, sharing meals together. But then there's gladness. You caught that in there. If this picture was an emoji, it would be that little smiley face with rosy cheeks. They gather. There's gladness. There's generosity, right? They give. You said that. They're like, they just give away everything they own. And then there's growth which I love. The Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. This isn't about a bigger building. This is about a richer kingdom. Now, when I see that picture, as many of you had, um, if you've ever heard or read Acts chapter 2, I have two immediate reactions, and you might be the same. The first is this, like, wistful curiosity, where I kind of let my mind go, and I go, man, what must that have been like? Wouldn't you love to be in that place? But then I have this, like, second, almost deeper reaction, this deep craving where I find myself saying, Lord, could you do that again? (laughs) Would you do that again, Lord? Because this is the irreducible core beneath all the complexities that we call church, right? This is Jesus unfiltered. This is the movement at its purest, at its most basic. And honestly, if you're like me... um, there's just something that wants to be swept up in that again. Don't you feel that? When I see this, I read Acts chapter 2, and I get that picture. I really see that. And then I look at this, like our world, everything out there, all the petty politics, the inane arguments, the distraction and the disconnection. Doesn't part of you just want to go, oh, Lord, would you help us be that again? Would you get us back there? How? How do you do that? Acts chapter 3 gives us part of that answer. This very ordinary scene with very ordinary people where something very extraordinary is about to happen. And so with that, Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John, you've heard of those guys before, were going into the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, that's about 3 o'clock. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms for those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. So quick pieces of cultural context just to help us understand what's going on here. You can picture this, but there's there's some richness here that I want to get. First off, first century Jewish rabbis taught that there were three aspects or three characteristics of the Jewish faith. Remember, the church is very Jewish at this point, especially most of Jesus' disciples are Jewish men. Most of the early disciples around those guys were Jewish people. They have a Jewish story. And so the Jewish faith was characterized by three things. First, Torah, Torah, which is keeping God's law. 
And then the second thing is worship. This is honoring God's presence. And then charity, which is blessing God's people. So according to the first century Jewish rabbis, if you were really in step with what God wanted for you, there ought to be this inward keeping of the law, this upward worship, and this outward blessing of God's people. Second piece of cultural context we've got to see here is that Peter and John are headed into the temple at the ninth hour. And if you've got a good study Bible or something with a footnote, you know that that's about 3 p.m. The temple hosted prayers at different times during the day. The 3 p.m. prayer time was the busiest because this was when sacrifices were made. 3 p.m. is when God's people remembered all that he had given them, and they want to give back to him. Now think for a minute, just a little aside, can you think of any other sacrifice that was important in the New Testament that was given at the ninth hour? That's when Jesus died. File that one away. Third piece of cultural context When God's people came to worship, they could enter the temple complex through one of ten gates. Nine of those ten were overlaid with silver and gold. Keep that image in your head for a second. Nine of those ten, silver and gold. But then this one was overlaid with Corinthian bronze. It was heavier, it stood taller, it cost more, and it shone brighter than these other ones. Hence the name, the gate called Beautiful. So with the temple buzzing as a busiest time of day, and worshippers' minds set on keeping God's law, celebrating God's presence, and blessing God's people, this nameless beggar perfectly positions himself where they can practice their piety. Think of this like first century Salvation Army bucket times 10. Okay? And it's easy to imagine this, right? Because we see the same thing today. There at the end of the off-ramp. Shameful look on his face, his eyes making disconnected contact. The inevitable hollowness of any reaction or interaction with people. What's in the cup holder? Let me see. Something left over I can give him. Dozens of people rush by, some changing lanes at the last minute. (laughs) I feel bad for that guy, but it makes me uncomfortable. Wish I didn't have to see that. Looking at their phones, trying not to see him. You ever noticed how life brings people into our life who call out our generosity? (laughs) And now I'm not talking about the guy at the end of the off-ramp. I'm talking about those relationships that test your ability to give. (laughs) And Christmas has a way of bringing them up, doesn't it? Those landmine conversations that you no longer feel the freedom to have. Those hairline fracture relationships that are beyond your ability to repair. Those decades-old arguments seem like water under the bridge. They're easier to ignore than to see and understand. And it's in those times, in those places, that's where generosity really reveals itself, isn't it? Hold on to that for a few minutes. Back to this scene. So, with a crowd of people emptying out and another stream flowing in, who walks by Peter and John? Peter, the rock, right? John, the beloved, surely these guys have something. And so he sees them and he thinks, oh, those were the guys that were with Jesus, right? They were with him when he healed those other people. Maybe this is my day. After 40 years, we learn in the next chapter, 40 years he's been there. Maybe it's time, maybe And so with his beggar's back against the rough rock wall, afternoon sun shining off the temple gate, he repeats his 40-year-old broken record request. And this time, he gets something that he did not expect. Take a look in verse 4. Peter directed his gaze at him. That's a very intentional word. As did John and said, look at us, and he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Finally, somebody sees me past the wish you weren't here gaze, and my day is finally here. I'm going to get something. And then here comes the crux that he never expected. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. 
We're going to come back to this text in just a few minutes. But for now, here's what I love about this. This guy is sitting here expecting that Peter and John are going to toss a couple coins his way. And Peter, in the name of Jesus, just shoots right past that and says, Yes, we're going to get to your dignity in just a second. Your dignity is coming. But for right now, I'm not content just to leave you with a coin. That's coming, but I want you to see something else. Sometimes... God does not want to give us something that just supports us in our current position. Sometimes God wants to introduce us to someone who can change our entire life. Or as one theologian put it, it's not the church's business in this world to simply only make the present condition more bearable. We do that, but also to release here on earth the redemptive work of God in Christ. So what happens? Now, some of you know this, but for those who don't, Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke is a doctor, okay? He's a medical man. Doctors love connections. Doctors love details. Doctors love specifics, especially when it relates to the human body. And so what follows is one part medical documentation and one part theological commentary. You'll see what I mean as we read this. Take a look in verse 7. And he, that is Peter took him by the right hand, raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Doesn't that sound like a doctor? Like you see all the medical stuff there? But here's what's interesting. That phrase, his feet and his ankles were made strong, you'd expect that to be a medical phrase. It sounds medical, doesn't it? Like he's an orthopedic surgeon or something. Especially coming from a doctor. You'd expect him to use a medical phrase. He doesn't. That phrase, were made strong, is lifted way back in the Old Testament. From Genesis chapter 1, and sometimes in the Psalms, and occasionally in the prophets. And I get this. It is only ever used when something is being made out of nothing, and God is the one doing it. It's used in Genesis 1 where God establishes and makes all the way through the Psalms. When it says, you made the heavens, you established them. That's the word. So follow me here. This isn't about a bone that was being out of place, just being set right again. That's not how Luke wants to see this. Although on one level, that's absolutely what's happening. But what's more true about this is this is God creating something good and beautiful and restorative and new where there was nothing. This is a beautiful picture of how what's happening to this man physically is also happening to him spiritually. But it gets better than that. What's with all the leaping? (laughs) It's kind of cool, isn't it? Luke says it two times in verse 8. Why does he leap? Why does Luke want to emphasize that? Now, at first it seems obvious because you're like, well, the dude was just healed. Like he's never walked a day in his life. Wouldn't you do that? And that's true. And if that's what we see here, we would be right, but we'd only be half right. There's something else that we need to see here. 700 years before this scene outside the gate in the temple, the prophet Isaiah, talked about him a couple weeks ago, he talked about what it would be like when Messiah would come and what you would have to look for when Messiah was actually here. This is Isaiah 35. Just listen to this. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped and the lame man shall leap, same word, like a deer The tongue of the mute sing for joy, for waters break forth in the wilderness and streams from the desert. Scoop down a couple of verses. It says, the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and they'll come into Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So this guy isn't just fulfilling his life's purpose. This guy is fulfilling 700 years of messianic prophecy that point to Jesus. Day after day, he sits there for 40 years. 
broken record alms request. Day after day, he's reminded that he's blemished, that he's unclean, that he's not whole. He can't go in. He's not welcome. Day after day, his physical ailment, I'm not well, contributes to his spiritual ailment, I'm not welcome. And then, at the name of Jesus, everything changes. Immediately. There is no 10 weeks of therapy here. (laughs) Immediately. Think about what that must have meant to him. For the first time in 40 years, he's pronounced clean. He enters the temple and he worships his God. He's had to watch everybody else do that for four decades and now he gets to join in. For the first time in 40 years, he doesn't feel the pain of being excluded, but the warmth of being included. For the first time in his life, he's not defined by what he can't do. He's defined by what Jesus has done. Christ and Christ alone. Like, this is what our Jesus does. So with the medical documentation out there and the theological commentary exploding like little red signal flares in the people's minds, the crowd's response is absolutely understandable. Take a look in verse 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. But now here is where the real power and permanence of this scene takes off. Because all that's awesome, but... Now we get to see what has to happen next because all this excitement demands an explanation, doesn't it? Peter, is this you? John, what kind of pixie dust do you guys have back there? What's going on? Take a look at verse 11. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. It was like this little porch off to the side. Think about it like the water cooler in the office. This is where people would go and have their private conversations while worship was happening over here. Now, if you're Peter or you're John, think about this, okay? Because part of you is going to want to go, yeah, don't you want to come to my church? I kind of got a good thing going on. Kind of the man. Or if you want to play by the line that modern faith healers do, if you want to get a share of this, click the link, have your checkbook ready. <laughs> but with all the power at his fisherman's fingertips, this crowd desperate for an explanation, and maybe some of his friends going, Yeah, Peter, what is all this? Peter grabs the spotlight with both hands and points it to the one place, the one person that matters. Verse 12. When Peter saw it, that means this big crowd, he addressed the people. He says, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we've made him walk? Great question. Why are you surprised? Now watch the turn. He says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate. Uh Uh-oh. And he decided to release, but you denied the holy and the righteous one and asked for a murderer, that's Barabbas, to be granted to you. He's imagining the crucifixion scene. You killed the author of life, who God raised from the dead. Clever turn of phrase there, Peter. To this we are witnesses. So verse 12 asks the question, how did, how did this happen? And then verse 16 will supply the answer. Here's what he says. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you now see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So a sort of subtle rebuke. You think this is about us? Followed by a not-so-subtle indictment. You guys know who used to do this kind of stuff, and you killed them. Followed by a not-so-subtle declaration, doesn't matter what you do, Jesus is king anyway. (laughs) And I love Peter's response here, because it's like he's saying, look, if this was about us, you should be completely amazed. But it's not about us. I don't heal anybody. Jesus does. I'm not good. Jesus is. I'm not generous. Jesus is. If there's anything good in me, it's Jesus. And so all I can do is just give away what I've already been given. But then, 
you can feel Peter almost step forward, lean in, and speak up. Because if you're part of this crowd that rushed in, you've seen this guy. You know him. He's, this guy is not a stranger to you at the gate. He's been sitting here for four decades. Maybe every once in a while you've tossed a couple of coins his way. And there's still this question. Because you go, okay, you say Jesus healed this guy. Okay. Not sure I believe that, although the evidence is kind of compelling. Um, what does this even mean for me? What am I supposed to do with this? Peter, so glad you asked. Verse 17, buckle up. And now, now I hear him go, <clears throat> and now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. That's a great statement, Peter. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, turn back to imperative verbs. Why? Three reasons. That your sins may be blotted out. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send the Christ appointed to you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, remember who he's talking to here, this is a decidedly Jewish audience, they know their Old Testament, so Moses is the man. He says, Moses even said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who came after him also proclaimed these days, you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, there he is again, second time he's introduced Jesus as a servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. There's a whole sermon in there, literally, that's what he's doing. But for now, three quick points. This is just solid gospel. Repent, repentance brings three results. I'm just going to hit it super quickly. Reconciliation with God, that's right there in verse 19. Refreshment from God, that's right there in verse 20. And restoration to God. They all start with the letter R, if you love that. That's right there in verse 21. Reconciliation, refreshment, and restoration. So with this beggar-turned-blessing standing there, and a crowd of people still wondering what's up, and a movement about to break, Peter has one giant point that he wants to get across, and here it is. Generosity is not about what I can give. Generosity is about who God has already given. It's just Jesus. Or if you want to put it another way, if you want to give what's best, you've got to give what, or what lasts. So what do we do with this? What does this have to do with Christmas, right? There's not a star or a sugar plum fairy in sight. So here's where we want to go. How do you give when you feel like you have nothing left? Answer, give away what you've been given. If you want to give what's best, you've got to give what lasts. I think there's three points I just want to wrap up here for our morning. These things that I want to challenge us to. When you think about generosity, especially this time of year, what does generosity mean? Like actual gospel generosity. What does it mean? First thing. Gospel generosity always points to Jesus. Always. Gospel generosity always points to Jesus. I want to be a generous person, don't you? Right? It's okay. You don't have to be like, you know, I just want to be a generous person. I know that's good for me. And I'm not talking about money. I've been given a lot. Like, we've all been given a life. We've been given talents and skills and abilities, and I want to use those things so that when my life is over, it isn't just about Brandon Marshall. And I imagine a lot of you are the same way. I don't want to amass a big pile. I just want to give it away. But one of the more frustrating aspects of generosity that I feel, especially at this time of year, is when I bump into my limits, what I can't give. <laughs> things I can't do. Things I can't fix. Go back to Peter and John for a second. Let's remember who these guys are. These guys are recently out-of-work fishermen who left the family business to follow around this semi-scandalous rabbi who hasn't been seen for a couple of weeks. 
professionally, these guys are not exactly upwardly mobile. <laughs> Politically, they're not very well connected. And personally, they are living at the emotional margin. You imagine that, right? They're probably sleepless and terrified, wondering, what are we going to do? That phrase, right in the middle of verse 6, where they say, silver and gold, I don't have. That phrase, you could lift that phrase out and replace it with a thousand and one different phrases. Things that you want to give other people, but you just can't. Silver and gold, I don't have. Secret to per perfect parenting, don't have it. Plan for a perfect marriage. Don't have that either. I wish I had the answer for anxiety and freedom from fear. Don't have it. Don't have the answer for every potential and pressing question. Don't have it. Don't have, I can't give you those things because I don't have those things. But what I do have is Jesus. <laughs> and isn't that the heart of discipleship? Really, we overcomplicate discipleship like crazy. Discipleship is not me courageously, confidently standing up saying, here I am with all my answers. Discipleship is courageously standing up and saying, here I am with just my Jesus. Or as one theologian famously quipped, evangelism is just one beggar showing another beggar where to get free bread. Here's the point. There are beggars' backs resting against the walls of our world too. And they're not really looking for money. Not really looking for a handout. We're all beggars, come on. Everyone, whether they can articulate it or not, everyone is looking for Jesus. They have just assigned different names for him and looked for him in places where he has not promised to appear. In this world of self-help, self-knowledge, self-obsession, I think one of the most audacious claims that you could make is that Christ and Christ alone can give you a life of meaning and purpose and peace. Do you really believe that? That gospel generosity is always about Jesus. So talk about him. Second point I want us to consider. Gospel generosity always means and. It always means and. Now here's what I mean by that. Lovers of Jesus do not choose between gospel proclamation or gospel demonstration. Followers of Jesus choose gospel proclamation and gospel demonstration. Now, here's what I mean. Gospel proclamation. This is giving the truths of the gospel in a way that Peter does in the latter half of this text, being clear in our doctrine, consistent in our belief, and compelling in our burden for lost people in our lives that we love. Practically, at Christmas time, gospel proclamation means initiating a spiritual conversation with a coworker, or bringing Jesus' name up at, at Christmas dinner with your family. Could mean inviting someone to a Christmas Eve service here at North Canton Chapel. Gospel proclamation. But then there's gospel demonstration. This is meeting the needs of those around us, something many of us feel drawn to at this time of year. In this case, in the text, it's literally being the hands and feet of Jesus. Practically at Christmas time, gospel demonstration might mean taking groceries to a family whose mom or dad is in the hospital. It might mean flipping your Christmas bonus around to somebody who lost their job. We're partnering with a missions partner here in North Canton Chapel. This is gospel demonstration. Gospel proclamation without demonstration is cold and disconnected and disembodied. It doesn't connect. But gospel demonstration without gospel proclamation is thin and weak and it just doesn't last. So let me tell you where Jesus wants you to live. And... As is so often the case with Jesus, he never asks you to choose this either or. He wants to invite you in this tension of living and. So really practically, this Christmas, let me challenge you with this. Live in the tension of and. Proclaim the name of Jesus and demonstrate the love of Jesus. Gospel generosity always means and. Third point that I want us to consider today. Gospel generosity always includes you. Here's what this means. Maybe you caught this, but this text is laid out in a really intentional way. Three giant moves. First, there's the story, okay, the what that happened. This guy that gets healed. Okay, the details, the what. 
Then there's the why this happened. Okay, when that's what Peter talks about, he goes, no, this isn't about us. This is about Jesus. Are you kidding me? You crucified the guy. He's the one that did it. But then there's this last piece. Verses 17 all the way through. Where Peter basically goes, okay, that, that. Now, here's what this means for you. Peter takes this anonymous beggar's physical healing as a launching pad to talk about the spiritual healing that every one of us needs. Because there's something that we need to see here. Jesus does this stuff all the time. He takes this physical thing and then he turns it into a platform to talk about something spiritual. Remember John 4? He meets a desperate woman at a well who's looking for water. And then he says, hey, do you know what I'm like? I'm like living water that always refreshes you. Then two chapters later in John 6, there's a crowd of 5,000 people who need bread. And then Jesus does this miraculous provision. And he says, hey, do you know what I'm like? I'm like the bread of life that always sustains you. This is how Jesus teaches us all the time. So let's overlay that onto this scene. Here's this guy who's completely unable, unclean, unwelcome. And then in Jesus' name, he becomes welcome and clean and holy and blameless and new. As much as we want to think about ourselves as Peter and John, looking at this text for lessons about how to be generous at Christmas time, the truth is we're not Peter and John. We're the beggar. Every one of us is needful spiritually. Every one of us is unable spiritually. Every one of us is incapable. And with our backs against the walls of our world, we silently sit wondering if our broken record requests are even heard. Sounds like this. God, why won't you fix this? God, why won't this go away? God, why won't this relationship get better? God, why won't this? You wonder if he hears you. And so the hard part, this is where this sounds almost maddeningly dismissive, to say, I don't know why. And I don't know when he's going to bring that restoration. I don't. But what I do know is the deepest need of each one of us is not a couple of coins that come our way from a passing by world. The deepest need that we have is the provision of God shown in Christ and Christ alone. This is about you. God has been very generous to you. God has been very good to you, and his greatest gift is for you. Remember that little bit about God making something out of nothing? About this isn't just a bone being set back into place. This blind or this, this beggar who was incapable that God somehow turned everything around. That newness, that brand new thing. Here's how the Apostle Paul talks about it when somebody accepts God's generosity with open arms and says, I need you to make me new. Here's what the Apostle Paul says it's like. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. I love that verse. Remember the first time I was reading the New Testament, like fully through. I was 18 years old and I came across that verse and I went, oh, that was good. It's like I tripped on that verse and I just couldn't get over it. The old is gone, the new has come? Really? A new creation. How does that happen? And so let me encourage you. There's two groups of people in here, I think, today. One, Maybe you have never really ever gone, I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. I, am, I got a lot of old stuff in my life and I need to get rid of it and I need Jesus to fix me. And so if that's you, I want to encourage you when we sing a song here in a minute, I want to encourage you just where you are, just to say, Lord, fix me, change me. I, I have offended you, I have sinned against you and I need you to make me new. But then there's another group of us that maybe our generosity doesn't look the way we want it to look. And maybe God's prodding you and pushing you by his spirit just to go, okay, I need to think about generosity a little bit differently. I need to give differently this year. I don't just want to write a check so I don't have to worry about something. I want to take Jesus to people who don't know him. And so if that's you, I just want you to sit in these moments and as we sing this song and say, God, show me. Show me what you have for me. Give me somebody this year I can just talk about Jesus with to give away what you've been given.
If we want to give away what's best, we've got to give what lasts. Let's pray. Father, it is good to be in this place and to reflect on your goodness. That your goodness never stops, you never give up or let up. You just want to show yourself over and over as a healer, as someone who fixes broken things, who brings reconciliation. This is what you do because it's what you're about. Lord, I know that there are so many of us that are just tired right now. I know we are at the frayed ends of a rope. So Lord, would you help us? Would you carry us when we can't carry ourselves and bring the reconciliation and restoration and redemption that we need from you? The times of refreshment from our God could come. Lord, would you do that? We say thank you for Jesus and his cross, his obedience that guaranteed our eternity with you. Father, move by your spirit. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.